There are some who might say, you know, I never go looking for trouble. The problem is, trouble keeps looking to find me. The scripture reflects a very similar stand when it comes to trouble. Remember old Job? Now there's a guy who ought to know a few things about trouble. In Job in 5 7, he writes, For man is born for trouble, just as sure as sparks fly upward. In 14 1, Joel writes, Man is of a few days and full of trouble. What does the Bible mean when it says trouble? Well, it's not just having a flat tire or, you know, cable went out. It's not things like that. When the Bible's talking about trouble, it means to experience things like worry, pain, disappointment, grief, and sorrow. These are the things that the Bible means when it says, talks about trouble. And we know from our experience it is a universal condition. It affects and afflicts all of mankind, every one of us. Well, as we read in our passage, as we're going through the Gospel of John, trouble was certainly attacking the disciples on that last night with Jesus as they gathered around the table. Right in the midst of all of that arguing and, and bickering and accusations and squabbling, as we read they were doing, they heard Jesus announce that one of them seated at the table was going to betray him that night. What? And then right after that, old Peter stands up. He boldly proclaims, I will, I will defend you. I am the super disciple. Not like these other guys. I'm the good one. And they heard Jesus rebuke him and say, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows in morning. What? And all of a sudden, although Jesus has been telling them over and over and over why they were going to Jerusalem and what was going to happen, suddenly the little light started to come on. And they began to understand what he'd been telling them. That he was going away and leaving them behind. Somebody, one of our own, is going to betray him? Peter, our leader? Peter is going to deny you? You're going to leave us here? All alone? Pain, panic, worry, concern, they just started to flood into their hearts. And they knew that the religious leaders had put out a contract and were looking for Jesus. Would, would they start looking for them too? And if Jesus leaves, he's not going to be there anymore to protect them. To tell them when to go and where to go and what to do. What are they supposed to do without Jesus? Where were they supposed to go? I mean, after all, they had left everything to follow him. And now he's leaving? Jesus knew the troubles in their heart. And so in the Gospel of John, in chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus tells them how to deal with these troubles. Look in your Bibles. John, chapter 14, 1 through 3. Very familiar passage. If you've ever been to a funeral, good chances are that you've heard this passage. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
First of all, notice that Jesus did not deny the fact that they were troubled. When he says, do not be troubled, he doesn't say, okay, since you're a follower and a believer, you're never going to experience trouble. He didn't say that. When he says, do not be troubled, it means don't continue being troubled. Yes, these things have happened. Yes, stuff is going on. Yes, it's hard. But don't let that preoccupy your mind and your heart and your soul. Do not be troubled means don't let this keep affecting you. Jesus knew that everyone has to deal with being troubled. Even Jesus himself was troubled. Back in 12, 27, just a couple of chapters back, as Jesus was contemplating the hour, he said, now the hour has now come. As he was contemplating what that meant, how he would assume the wrath of God for the sins of all mankind, and he knew that he would be separated because of the sins that he would take upon himself. He'd be separated from the Father for the first time ever. What did he say? He said, my soul is now troubled. And in the last chapter, just as he was about to announce that one of his disciples, Judas, was going to, or had already betrayed him, but he announced that it was going to happen. He had, had already been done. The deal had already been made. In 1321, he expressed that pain of that disappointment of having Judas who he had loved and cared for and nurtured and taught and who had seen everything that he had done and heard all the sermons. He was troubled by the disappointing betrayal. And the Bible says, and being troubled in his spirit, he said these things. Rather than to deny that troubles are common, rather than deny that they are going to happen, rather than deny that the presence of trouble was there in the hearts of the disciples, he gave them a few ways in this passage to find comfort in dealing with these times, in these trials, in these troubles. He says, let me tell you how you can not continue to be troubled when you are attacked by trouble. First thing, believe in God. Believe in God. He says, believe in God, and if you believe in God, you must also believe in me. The passage as we read them in our scripture don't, doesn't always pick up the different inflection of the verb. But basically it's what Jesus is saying, yes, if you believe in God, then you also have to believe in me. To them at this point in time, Jesus is I'm leaving. And you can't go with me. I'm out of here shortly. And they're thinking, oh my goodness. All the plans and everything that Jesus had, it's all falling apart at the seams. And somehow, if Jesus is the Messiah that the Father sent, and He's leaving, does this mean that God has failed? Jesus says, no. Believe in God. Just because you don't understand why things are happening, you need to continue in your belief, in your faith, in your trust in God. If you have faith and trust in God to rule and reign over the heaven and over the earth, then you must have that exact same faith in Jesus. We've been reading all through John. Jesus has been telling us that. He said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. If you hear me, you've heard the Father. If you receive me, you've received the Father. Later, he will say, I am the Father and one. So he says, look, you may not understand what I'm about to do, but if you believe in God, if you have faith in God, that he's in control and his plan is working, then you need to have that exact same faith in me. God does not fail. Jesus is saying, neither do I. 
<clears throat> we apply that to ours. So when troubles begin to burden our hearts and it wants to crush our spirit, just remember that God is in control. There's no aspect of anything. You know, God knows where every single atom and every part of an atom is at all times and what it's doing. Everywhere. If there's something about the smallest piece of any atom that he doesn't know about, he ain't God. He knows everything and he's in control. And he loves us. And he died for us. And he's making sure that all things, even our troubles, he is going to work them out for our good. We don't like to hear it, but the fact that we experience troubles is one of the main ways that God uses to refine us in our faith. But we have to trust in Him. That's what Jesus means when He says, believe in God and also believe in Me. So that was the first way that they could be comforted in the midst of the troubles. Secondly, Jesus starts talking about in my Father's house. My Father's house. That's heaven. And by him saying this, the way that we have comforted that is we can understand that heaven is an actual physical place. It's not just some state of mind as many cults declare, declare it to be. You know, some say that really if you're reincarnated enough times and you attain to a certain spiritual level, you get elevated, the point that you're achieving, the ultimate that you can hope to gain, what you're asking and working for, if you make it to the mountaintop, is the blessed state of nothingness. Seems like a lot of work for nothing. <laughs> Jesus says, no, it's my Father's house. It's not some wispy, ghostly apparition. It's not some dreamy reality. It is a real and physical place. Because Jesus says, I'm going there. And we know Jesus was resurrected in a physical, glorified body. And he was physically ascended up into heaven. They yeah, watched him go. So the physical Jesus physically left and he didn't just go into nothing. He went home to be with the Father. And that's where he's been for these past couple centuries. Seated at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing? Napping? No. He is calling people into the kingdom. Through faith. And he is interceding every single day. For you and me. A lot for me. A lot. But he is busy doing that. In this place. It is a house. It is a home. When we think about kingdom, since we don't have kingdom, that's just kind of one of these terms we throw out. And it is home. If you've ever been in a hospital for a few days, what is the main thing on your mind? Yeah. I just want to go home. Well, you're really sick, Mr. Preston. I don't care. I just want to go home. I'll be better if I can just get home. Men and women in our military service, no matter where they are, they are counting down there, putting X's on the calendar. For what? When they get to go home. Home is the place where you feel like you belong. Home is the place where you feel like you can truly rest. <coughs> because it is the place in our minds and in our hearts that we associate it with a place of security and a place of comfort. Remember Dorothy? <laughs> There's no place like home. If it's such a wonderful place, let me ask you a question. How much time do you spend thinking about heaven? I mean, I'm not talking about sitting down trying to figure out what those golden streets are really made of or how high the jasper walls are. I'm not talking about that. You know, what I'm with all of those sort of things. How much time do you think about heaven as being the absolute fulfillment of what we consider our earthly homes are? You see, our earthly homes just give us a taste. And our longing for our earthly homes is nothing 
compared to the ultimate fulfillment of reaching our heavenly home. The place where we have complete rest. We can still go home and the hot water tank breaks. Right? We can go home and the wind blew the uh, awnings off of the side of the house last night. We still have problems at home, but we long for that. How much time do we think about our eternal home? A place where there will be a place of joyful, peaceful existence. I would say every day, but there's no days there. There's no night there. It just is. Freedom from all contention. Freedom from all strife. All sicknesses, illnesses. All pain, all sorrow. None of that is there. You know, if you were going to travel to, to another country or maybe the other side of, of the country to a specific city and you're going to be there for a while, I'm going to tell you, you're getting, you're getting these little books or whatever. We used to, Fedora, I think was the name, used to publish these books. And every time Marsha and I would go away to another country, we'd go buy one of them books. Oh, and when we were going through the book, we were looking at what restaurants, places to eat, where we're going to go. They got maps in there. We we're planning it all out. You're going on a cruise, there you are. Googling it up, man. You're looking at the layouts of every deck. You're trying to figure out where that midnight cafe is going to be. Right? How close to the elevator you are. Where the swimming pool is. All that stuff. You're looking at all your planning. You are studying how much work you are doing for this place that you're only going to be for a short, a short time. We spend a lot of time concentrating on places where we're going to go that are temporary. Our home here on this earth is just temporary too. How much time do we spend each day thinking about all that the Father and all that Jesus have in store for us when we get to make that trip? So when troubles come knocking, down here, because they won't up there, and they do become troublesome, just remember to think about our home, our real home, our eternal home. We have a longing to be there. Ever since Adam and Eve got evicted, man has been seeking and trying to find a way to get back Knowing that Jesus has prepared a place for you. And your place is waiting. And that he has left the light on, as the commercial says. Will come as a great source of comfort. When the troubles are afoot. Third thing he tells us. The third thing he says to those who have placed their faith in God and in his son. And for those who then, when times are tough and hard, they focus their attention on the things of heaven instead of dwelling on the things of this earth. Jesus makes this incredible promise. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, well, he said I'm going, so there really isn't any doubt. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you to myself. This is a, an assurance. This is a promise. Because in the sentence, well, how it is structured, it is saying, just as surely as I'm leaving, which we know he is, as surely as I left, you can know that I'll return. If the fact that Jesus left and ascended into heaven is an absolute fact, then we can know that the absolute fact is he's coming back again. If the first thing is true, Jesus says, the second thing has to be true as well. well. Why is this such a comfort in times of trouble? Those times of worry and grief and disappointment attack us. How do we gain comfort? It's the promise not only of a new home, but of a new body. How many of you like to sign up for a new body right now? <laughs> yeah, man. I'll tell you what. And by next week, there'll be a few more hands. <laughs> when Jesus comes again, and that trumpet sounds, the 
Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then the souls of all those who are living believers will join with Jesus in the air. Y'all remember that? Promise? Remember that? The souls of those believers who have died, well, they are with Jesus now. He will have their souls. But it says, but the dead in Christ will, will rise. Well, if the souls are already there, what's rising? Well, it's whatever DNA, whatever part of their body is here on this earth that is mixed and mingled, whatever minerals and things are, will come up out of the ground and go to meet Jesus and be reunited with their souls. And when they're reunited, they will have a new and glorified body. But it also says that those who are living at that point in time, right after the dead in Christ go up, and are given glorified bodies right on their heels are the souls and the bodies of believers. And when they get up to join Jesus in the air, their bodies are transformed into new and glorified bodies. Jesus is saying, listen, things are hard here, but I want you to think about this. Whether you're alive or a dead, I've got a new glorified body in store for you. I've made a place for you, and I have made a body for you, and none of them will ever wear out. And they will be perfect. No matter how much the troubles assault our minds and our bodies, because worry and grief and trials and troubles take a toll on us physically as well. All of those things are only temporary. And when we think about the fact that we're going to get a new body that is perfectly designed and outfitted to suit that new home, it's going to be the perfect match. Jesus says, think about that. When things are hard here, remember, these things are temporary. i got a new home. I got a new body for you. I've made them both because I love you. And I've made them both because you have faith in my Father and in me. These things, think about them and ponder them when things get hard and troubles attack. Maybe one more little quick thing to consider. Jesus didn't say, hey, listen, when I come, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to swing by and pick you up in a taxi, take you up to heaven, and just drop you off outside the gate and let you walk in. That's not what he said. Is it? What did he say? He said, when I come and get you, I will personally receive you to myself. I will receive you to myself. He will receive each individual person individually. It's as if when you get there, since he can be a lot of places a lot of time, he can go everywhere, every time, any place. He will be able, it's almost as if you can visualize him welcoming you and wrapping his arms around you. I will receive you to myself. I am going to hold you in my arms so that you will know that I will never, ever let anything ever come up against you again. You will never have to face any trouble ever again. I promise. Because a lot of times, troubles continue who come into our lives. Some of you might be experiencing some troubles today. And I can assure you that if you're not, if you just look a little further out on the horizon, they're coming. They're on the way. But Jesus says, when they come, look up. Quit looking out on the horizon Quit looking at yourself. Look up. Focus your faith on God. The God who never loses control of our lives. And He 
never gives up control of our lives to another. Focus your thoughts, feed your emotions with the promise of a new home. If you think it feels good to show up after a week's vacation and finally get home, that is nothing compared to what it's going to be like to walk into the home where God has built and designed for you to live with Him forever. Think about that. That home that will satisfy the desires of your heart. And keep looking up and listening for that trumpet. Jesus is coming. Jesus right now is in heaven and he is praying for you every single day. And he is coming, folks. And he will be here the instant that the Father sends him to get you. There will be no delay. Jesus knew that the troubles were attacking his disciples. And they felt lost and hurt and confused and disappointed and sorrowful and grief. All of these things were attacking their hearts. And so he gave them these promises for them to use. But it's the same promises he gives for us to use today too. And when the troubles happen, if we just stop and consider those wonderful truths, those blessed promises that he gave and shared with us, then we can absolutely know that in times of trouble, we just need to stop, remember God, remember where our home is, and remember that the Lord is coming for us to give us a new body and a new existence. And remember, in light of all of those wonderful promises, when the troubles happen, stop and think, man, I am way too blessed to be stressed. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for the many times and ways that you keep speaking to our minds and hearts because we are plagued with troubles. There are things that attack our hearts and cause us to worry, concerns, Lord, that we have. Help us to see beyond the temporary. Help us to focus on the things of heaven, the things that are eternal. Help us to keep our minds and our eyes focused on Christ. Help us to build and strengthen our faith in you each and every day. To know that you are in control. And Lord, help us to accept the fact that you use these troubles to purify us and to draw us closer to you. Lord God, we are thankful that you love us. We are thankful and we desire to be home with you. We are so looking forward to those mansions those shiny streets, those jasper walls, and to be in the presence of our Savior. And it's in His name we pray.